This video is the first part of a three-part series that looks at how the form of the Schwarzschild metric is determined using symmetry arguments. In this first video, it shows how the metric takes a diagonal form using arguments involving the invariance of the line interval. And this video is an updated version of the original Schwarzschild metric in the first of this series, in which I've just added a, some Cs back into some terms where I took them out in the the original video of this title, I took out the C's for visual simplicity, but as one viewer has pointed out, maybe it should be included. So I'm just remaking this video by putting in, in the first part, those missing C's, speed of light terms. All right, so given a spherically symmetric distribution of mass M, the mass is not rotating. Now we seek a metric G mu nu that describes the space time outside this mass. All right, now, a static space-time is one for which all the components of G mu nu, the metric, are independent of T, so they don't depend on time, and the line element ds squared is invariant under the time transformation T to minus T, so under time reversal, it doesn't change, it's invariant. Now, a space-time that satisfies the first but not the second is called a stationary space-time. Now our metric has to form this, and we're looking to find, to determine in this video, what these terms should be. It's symmetric uh, under reversal of the indices, and so we're seeking to find a metric. Ultimately, the metric we will find will be a diagonal one, and all the off-diagonal terms, that's all these, and these will be zero. Now the line element or interval ds squared is in this form here. And given the symmetry of the situation, we're going to choose the coordinates x mu, x0, x1, x2, x3, ct, r, theta, and phi. Now, the coordinates I use in all these videos are ct, r, theta, and phi. Um, and as a viewer pointed out, I was missing the c in some of these. For instance, down here, I've taken the c's out. And so I'm remaking this video by simply putting all the c terms back in. Uh, which I think is a good idea for people learning it for the first time to see it in its complete form. So stationarity of the metric requires that the partial derivative with respect to the time coordinates of the metric is zero. So none of the metric uh, terms depend on T. Now the static nature of this space time requires invariance of the time element, uh, under sorry, invariance of the line element under time reversal. So dt replaced with minus dt, we want a metric that's the same under such conditions. Now, that means we can rule out various cross terms in the metric. And just to show you this, under time reversal, we have minus c dt times minus c dt still becomes c squared dt squared. So that term's unaffected. So when you write out the line element, you have ds squared is g00 c squared dt squared plus g01 c dt dr. Now, under time reversal, minus C dt dr does not equal C dt dr. And so when you write out the line element in both cases, before time reversal and after time reversal, the squared term's fine, but these cross terms are not. And this line element is a different line element to this one. And so what that means is we can rule out cross terms because of this argument that under reversal of time, time reversal dt with minus dt, we should have the same line interval. And clearly, as you can see here, we don't. This minus term here means that this form doesn't agree with this form here. And remember, uh, <clears throat> and just one other thing, the stationarity of the metric requires that the partial derivative of the metric terms with respect to t is zero. And so we can rule out. We can also rule out minus c dt d theta um, because that doesn't equal c dt times d theta and same here in the d phi direction as well. They're not equal. And so we can rule out those cross terms there. So we've been able to cancel those ones out. That's g 0 1, 0 2 and 0 3. So 0 2 was minus c dt d theta not equal to c dt d theta and the um, 0 coordinate and the third coordinate, that's 0, 3 here, again, they don't, they're don't; they not equal. So whatever our ultimate metric is, these terms here must be 0. 
because under time reversal, we can't have a change. <clears throat> Remember, um, right, so we've got a metric that's independent of time. And whether you play it going forward in the universe's history or going backwards in the universe's history, the field, the if you like, the gravitational field around the um, spheric mass, the spheric mass that we saw earlier, spherically symmetric mass, doesn't change, and so it's independent of time. All right, so dr now with minus dr, or minus dr times minus dr gives us dr squared, so reversal of distance, but minus dr d theta does not equal dr d theta. And also minus dr d phi does not equal dr d phi. So again, there's something else we can cross out as well. And so these terms here vanish. That's g. All right. These ones vanish. 1, 2, and 1, 3. And their symmetric counterparts here vanish as well. So we're just left with this bit down here to determine. All right. Now, if we have a look under rotation in the positive direction and in the negative direction, for both d theta and d phi, we see that minus d theta minus d phi is d theta squared, but minus d theta times d phi does not equal plus d theta d phi. And so these terms have been crossed off as well. Minus d phi times minus d phi gives us d phi squared, but minus d phi d theta does not equal d phi d theta, and so on. We can cross out these other terms over here. So the only terms yet to be determined are the diagonal ones. And just by symmetry arguments, we've been able to rule out um, these cross terms. All right. Um, so we have a highly symmetric space-time around this spherical mass. So our line element now has this form. ds squared is this object here. And in this video, I put back that c squared there. That was the point of remaking this video. And so we need to find the form of the coefficients of this line element. We need to find g00, g11, g22, g33. Now the rotational invariance of the situation suggests we use the rotationally invariant quantity r to find the form of the metric. What we have is this spherical mass sitting in space-time, and we want to know what is the gravitational field around it. What is the geometry around this spherical mass? So it suggests that the radial direction is important. In the angular directions, nothing's going to change. There's a high degree of symmetry here. Whatever this field is, whatever moving in the uh, theta or phi direction, in the polar or azimuthal directions, won't change the field. It's, it will be independent of these. So let's have a look at what we get. So using spherical polar coordinates, we have these here. Next step. We want to build a line element from combinations of powers of dt, dr, d phi, and d theta because they're our coordinates. And the metric part of this line element cannot depend on time, so that only leaves the radial variable r and the angular variables. <clears throat> now, the following form gives us powers of the variables we seek. Remember, our line element must be in squares of dt, dr, d theta, d phi. And if we look at the position vector r, r is x, e, x plus y, e, y plus z, e, z. These are the Cartesian basis vectors. And here's our position vector here, spherical polar coordinates. We see that combinations of uh, c squared dt squared and this constant, uh, a constant here is a function of r times c dt r dot d theta, c of r, r dot dr, all squared, dr dot dr. All of these combinations will end up giving us uh, an expression involving theta, phi, r, and t. It covers all possibilities. All right? And if you play with that a little bit independently, stop the video, get a bit of paper and a pen, and work your way through it, you'll see that all these different combinations will give us a line element squared in terms of squared terms with various constants a, b, c, and d in front of them. All right, given, and your starting point is this vector r, position vector in Cartesian coordinates, go to spherical polar coordinates, and then start performing these operations. All right. All right. In the radial direction, a basis vector, coordinate basis vector, dr, dr, 
if we take the partial derivative of the position vector r with respect to the coordinate r, we'll get this object here. If we take the, the partial derivative of the position vector r with respect to theta, we'll get the e theta coordinate basis coordinate basis vector, and for a coordinate basis vector in the phi direction, dr d phi will give us this object here. And of course, the unit vectors will be dr d phi um, multiplied by one on the modulus, one on the magnitude, square root of the magnitude of the vector, this object here. So that a basis vector, a unit basis vector in the r direction is just this. If you take the dot product with this, and you'll find it's equal to one, square root it's still one. Uh, um, a b unit basis vector in a theta direction is 1 on r e theta, and a unit basis vector in the phi direction will be this object here. Well known results, of course. All right, just repeating them again er is er hat, e theta is r e theta hat. If you wanted to go back to the coordinate basis vectors, this would be r times the unit vector in the theta direction. Phi would be r sine theta times the unit basis vector in the phi direction. And r would be r times r hat. dr then is dr d theta, uh, dr dr times dr plus this differential expression here of the three differentials. er dr, e theta d theta, e phi d phi. And then we could write that with the dr and we could write that as r d theta. Remember, e theta was r e theta hat. So that went in, that's how we've got this. Replace that with, see how we've gone here from e theta to e theta hat, e r to e r hat, same here, e phi to e phi hat. And so we've got these constants, or well, variables, sorry, differentials, sorry, out here, r times d theta, r sine theta d phi, all right? Then dr dot dr will be dr squared here, remember er dot dr was a unit vector, so that's magnitude of one, so we get dr squared here. Um, e theta dotted with itself is one, e phi dotted with itself is one because they're unit basis vectors, and so they drop out when we do dr dot dr, and we're just left with dr squared plus r squared d theta squared plus r squared sine squared theta d phi squared. Notice that um, r dot dr gave us r squared, and r dot dr gave us r dr, and again, you can work those on paper to see for yourself that's the case. All right, so let's start our line element squared. ds squared will be this object here. All right, and let's start expanding that out. When we do that, when we perform these operations here, as on the previous page we saw, we end up with this object like this. Remember, dr dot dr gave us all of this, if you remember on the previous page, and r dot dr gave us this, r dot dr gave us that, and we had the cdt here. Okay, now, ultimately our goal will be to find a, b, c, and d, and we'll make various uh, substitutions for this. And our first step will be to absorb factors of r into the coefficients so that our we have new a, b dash, c dash, d dash, and they are, a is unaffected in this case, but a new b dash will be simply absorbing the r here into it, and then we'll call it b dash of r. Still a function of r, but we'll call it b dash of r. Notice that these coefficients, I should have said earlier in the video, there's no time present in them. Remember, the metric was independent of time. All right, so we wish to find what these are. <clears throat> The C here, all of this will be combined to make a new term C dash. And here, um, all of this will be combined to make a new term D dash. All right, now, define a new radial coordinate R bar squared is D dash of R. And people have worked this out before us, <laughs> long before us, and they've worked it out through trial and error, and they've discovered what works. So R bar squared, Replacing for d dash gives us this object here. Now we introduce a new time coordinate t bar given by c d t bar is f of r bar, all of this, okay, dr bar and so on. And here's the old c d t here. All right. Now square it and solve for a and b dash. 
So squaring here, we've got c squared dt bar squared, f squared, and then expanding this out. <clears throat> and we have all of this here. Here we go. Like that. And let me assure you, it will work. All right, next bit, um, divide through by f squared, this object here. And then what we're going to do is take this bit on to the left side here. We're left with this bit here. All right, now rewrite that. Here it is, that bit on the right there, over here. And we're going to divide through by A. <clears throat> and we're going to have, um, just dividing through by A, we'll lose the A squared and that'll become just A here. Dividing through gives us this object here. All right, next thing now is, um, remember this is A of R bar, C squared that plus b dash of r bar, c dt dr bar. So we have all of this over here, just putting the r bars back in, otherwise nothing's changed. Next bit, ds squared is then this object here, which is on the end starting to look like the Schwarzschild metric, but just <clears throat> we need to, short style line I'm sorry, but uh, we still have a fair bit of work ahead of us. So let's define a new A bar as this whole object here, because remember this is just functions of R, so let's just call this A bar as a function of R bar, and put that in there, and B bar we will define as all of this, because that is dr bar squared, dr bar squared here. So let's combine it all in together one. So we now have ds squared is minus a bar, that, plus b bar, that. It's getting better. It's looking better. We're getting to our final result, r bar here. Okay. Now just dropping the bars because um, we, we, we still just have functions. All we have here is a function of r. So might as well just call it a of r because it is only a function of r, b of r, and so on. So we're on our way there, we're getting better. We've reduced the number of things we need to find down to this a and this b. We're getting closer. All right, so our metric is given by this object here, which is looking very good, <clears throat> but still a little bit of work ahead of us. Now, very far from the source mass, the field becomes asymptotically flat, and so in the limit as r approaches infinity, a of R needs to approach 1 as we approach Minkowski space, uh, space time, and limit B of R needs to approach 1 as well. Uh, and then we, we're starting to have the Minkowski metric in spherical polar coordinates. So that's minus 1, that's 1, R squared, R squared, sine squared, theta. Then we have the Minkowski metric in spherical polar coordinates. Now from the weak field limit, we have, and there was a previous video on the weak field limit, we have minus A of R was this object here, and next bit where phi was minus GMM on R, big M, small M was, was minus GM on R, for the test mass M equals 1, we could say phi, so a test mass uh, unit mass, would give us phi is then minus gm on r, which is a field outside of a mass m at a distance r, gravitational potential. And finally, a of r was my, is equal to 1 minus 2 gm on c squared r. And so the metric g mu nu is this object here, whatever b of r is, but we can say now this first term is here. Remember we found on the previous page phi and we had Okay, and when we substitute, we had phi over um, 2 phi over c squared, and we put that in here, gives us this object a of r. Okay, and so in the next video, video we'll determine the form of the b of r term. Now, when you look at this video, also look back at the original, it didn't have the c's in, um, okay, and then you can see that the story is covered between the two.